water quality and wetlands session. My name is Tammy Hustenberg. Um, I'm here sort of in two capacities. I work for the Department of Environmental Conservation, but I'm also a master's student at the um, I'll be moderating this session. We have some great speakers. Um, we're going to do 20 minutes, and I think we're sticking to the 20 minutes. Um, we're going to leave the last five for uh, questions and answers. So I have a little card over there pulled up. I'm going to give you an idea. I'll give you like a five minute warning. Um, and then, let's see, I guess that's it. So the intro, um, this is Jamie Shanley. Jamie has a BS in Environmental Engineering from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute uh, in New York. He has an MS in Environmental Science from the University of Virginia and a PhD in Geology from the University of Wyoming. He's worked as a research hydrologist and biogeochemist at the U.S. Geological, Geological Survey in Vermont since 1991. The action research centers on mercury and organic matter transport by streams. Uh, James Hawkins entitled Hydrology. All right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> So my co-author in this, Beverly Wemple, we worked together at these two sites since they started in 2000. I just want to mention right off that these are threatened and endangered pages right now. Um, if you look on our website, they're still going to be offline December 31st. We are really hoping to find a way to keep them going because we have 15 years of unbroken record so far. We're also trying to expand take away the ages but expand to a, a broader uh, high elevation monument network. I'll touch on. <clears throat> and uh, I just want to also mention that a lot of people have also worked on our study over the years, uh, including uh, Harry Thomas and uh, Steve Chris and the States and Research Sites for some of biological monitoring and uh, many, many students. So I want to talk about the need for science in high elevations uh, and give a background for our gauging, which is really a paired watershed study. Talk about the differences in flow we're seeing between the two gauges and why that might be happening. And I want to touch on extreme events because we've been seeing a lot of them and a lot more of them lately. And then at the end, I'll get to some water quality if there's time. So there's a lot of pressure on our high elevations. Um, increasingly, resort development, uh, wind power, uh, real estate, you know, these, these ski resorts are becoming four season resorts and they're expanding the amount of land they want to use. Biomass harvesting is, is a big pressure. So the need is there to understand what's going on. And then the climate's also changing. This, I like this plot from the Gun Institute where the number of days with an inch of rain or more per year is really taking in. Increase over the last couple of decades, and uh, if anything, it seems to be exacerbated in, in high elevation areas. High elevation areas. So we need more science up high. Not, 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 <coughs> the high elevations are underrepresented in our engagement network, um, and in the high elevations, water is kind of a, a unifying thing. There are many issues, high, but they all center in some way around water. So our study uh, was a nice aerial view of our two watersheds, and uh, it's the West Branch is the developed watershed, which contains the entire um, Stone Mountain Resort, and to the left of there, Ranch Brook is a pretty much undisturbed watershed. I mean, it was logged a century ago, but the forest has grown back, and really the only disturbance there now is cross-country centuries, which is much less this, this kind of shows better how the West Branch watershed really uh, encompasses the entire resort pretty much within the confines of the watershed boundary. And this is the uh, Route 108 that goes over Stony Notch here. So this area straddles that. So pretty much the entire watershed's affected, and very little of the resort uh, spills over to the Branch Brook watershed. Uh, so a classic paired watershed study would be monitoring uh, both watersheds before anything ever happened there. We already had a ski area there, so it's not you know, a, a classic paired watershed in that sense. But the resort has been on a lot of expansion since we've been working there, so we do have an opportunity to test the effect of that. 
just a few characteristics of the watersheds. The West Branch watershed is slightly higher. Um, this just shows the distribution of elevation. So if you look at the 50% line, the median elevation is about you know, a couple hundred feet higher at West Branch. And of course, it goes up to the summit of Mount Mansfield, whereas uh, West Branch uh, River only gets just to 4,000 feet. And that's just a picture of Ranch Brook right here on page. So hypothetically, this is the sort of thing you might expect from development, where uh, your nice, broad, hydrograph peak, which you see in blue, might change to more of a flashy situation where you get more rapid runoff because of all the disturbance and compaction of soils. Water distance grew quicker, you get a higher peak, uh, but then uh, <clears throat> receives down quickly, and um, so, so of course the erosive power is much greater in the yellow hydrograph. Uh, so these two gauges are, uh, if you go to the BMC website, you'll see the reference to them and uh, a link to the USGS site where you can look at the real time, at least till the end of the spot. <laughs> Time data. <clears throat> so, some data. Um, what this shows is the amount of runoff in millimeters from the two streams. So, if you can directly compare, if you, if you compare your runoff in millimeters, you can directly compare to the amount of precipitation coming in. You don't have precipitation on this plot, but it's about 2,000 millimeters a year over the basin, maybe, maybe a little less than that. Uh, if you think Burlington's, it would be about 1,000 millimeters, that's 30 inches. Uh, much, much greater precipitation up there. And of course, not all the precipitation runs off, so that's why these numbers are less than 2,000. But, and why it doesn't run off, it, it evaporates and transpires. Um, the stream flows is the remaining that's not used by the forest. And so when you convert it to millimeters, you can directly compare the two basins, even though they're slightly different areas. Um, but if they have the exact same amount of unit area, these bars would be the same height. You see they're always higher at West Branch, the developed watershed, uh, consistently. I mean, the, the range is different from year to year, and the range is actually from 11% to 44%. So huge range, but uh, always consistently higher at West Branch. Now, is this because of the ski area? I mean, it does fit the hypothetical uh, flashier hydrograph where a lot of water runs off of it. But since we don't have any data from before there was a ski area, we're a little reluctant to say there might not be natural differences in the hydrology that could be driving this. And then if we just, <clears throat> one thing that struck us is the sheer magnitude of the runoff from these sites. It's really high. So we just looked at different sites around the region. And uh, this is the ski area watershed. This is the control. Um, the only other uh, gauge in Vermont or New Hampshire that, that came close to these was the Ellis uh, River in New Hampshire, which is, comes out of Pickup Notch. That's another high elevation site. <coughs> So it's really unusual the amount of water coming up right now. And so how does that runoff distribute itself through the year? Is there anything in the seasonal pattern that we can look at to kind of get an uh, insight into why the streams are different? Why the runoff is more at West Branch. And we do see that, um, and the green line is kind of the difference between the two plots. So we see that the runoff is fairly similar through the fall. I start in October, that's where I want to get to The runoff is pretty similar. Where it starts to divert really is at snowmelt. And then it kind of continues to merge into the summer. So <clears throat> it's something about the snowmelt process, maybe more snow in this basin, that's one possible uh, suggestion. And then and that that extra snowfall could sustain base flow through the summer. And then I just kind of split it up by one. So you can again see that the snow melt is really going to diverge. So, uh, one, one 
funny part of it here is that there is snow main on the skiing side, of course. And that is water that's entirely within the basin. They take it out just before it comes to our gauge, put it up in the mountain. So of course you're going to get a delayed spot, a delayed uh, flow there. So that's part of the, of the answer. And also, oops, also um, the, this is snow making water withdrawal. Um, and then I just have about four plots of different uh, seasons here. So here is like a fall period. We see West Branch uh, showing much more flow. This is the snowmelt. And the snowmelt itself, the early part of the snowmelt, they seem to match up pretty well. And it's late in snowmelt where the West Branch, the developed basin, really starts to race ahead. And then they <coughs> sustain through the summer much higher flows at that gauge. So we're way too slow here. Is that five minutes total left? Oh, okay. okay. So um, I mentioned that we seem to be seeing a lot more intense events. That makes sense. And uh, what I have plotted here is just the peak flow from every year at both of the gauges. And we just had a lot of them in 2010, 2011, 2013, and 2014. So many that I even put the second highest peak in those years in the open circles. So it just, <clears throat> there's a lot, there's been a lot, a lot of water. And I, I, you know, this sure looks like a trend, but I would say caution, 15 years doesn't make a trend. But, but certainly, there have been a lot of events. I'm not going to say it's global warming. Uh, <clears throat> it's just been a phenomenal. And just for reference, that's our research watershed in the Northeast Kingdom, which we've been monitoring since 1991. That's the highest flow we've seen. So definitely higher flows in these mountain environments. And the other really interesting aspect of this is that these peak flows that I put up there, they're often not even on the same day. They can be from completely different storms. So where there's a green dot, that means the peak was on the same day. But about half of the years, it's from a completely different event. And that just speaks to the enormous spatial variability you get in the mountains. Um, and also that these storms are not necessarily the ones that make the news. It's not our green or <coughs> green void. It can be just an isolated cell that sits there and dumps an enormous amount of rain pretty quickly. Um, so just some more examples of storm one. Slower, so I'll <clears throat> speed up. But 2011 was that really big year that just shows how that related to the average on the average. So, let's see a lot more. And I showed a few slides of water quality. Now, this is work we did mostly at the beginning of the study in the early 2000s. And hope we can find some funding to get more into this again. Of course, we have to the gauges themselves. But uh, we had some uh, sensors out there to look at total suspended solids. And surprisingly, they were pretty high during high flows at both gauges. So we did so we'll just talk about it to the same scale, kind of similar. So that was a little surprising. We didn't see more at the, at the developed site. Um, this is conductivity. You can see the dilution. But the big difference between the two sites is in chloride. And there's not a lot of highway above the ski resort that gets salted because that road is closed from there. This is just from the parking lot. So very high concentrations of chloride coming off this, this area. But this, uh, the high uh, chloride extends well into the summer. So this, this is a summer storm, a late summer, and it really indicates clearly that this salt is made into the groundwater system because it actually dilutes through the event. So to, to sum up, get ready for any questions. Um, so we're seeing about 20% more runoff at the developed basin. Um, we're not sure why the ski area 
may have an effect, but it's hard to imagine that you could have that great of an effect. Uh, there must be some natural differences in the technology there, and, and greater precept is certainly a, a good candidate to, to explain that. But we haven't been able to, to document that yet, despite the trying. Um, uh, greatest difference in snow melt in the summer, and just really want to emphasize these extreme events and their seeming increasing nature, but their isolation and, and uh, severity. So we are, um, I have a little bit of time to write up results from our 15 years, I'll be doing that over the winter. We do have one paper out on this by Beverly in the early, uh, we're about the mid-2000s, and this will be the follow-up to summarize what we got this time. Thanks. Jamie, could you go back to the chloride slide, please? Chloride slide? Yeah. And while I'm, next one, uh, the one with the chloride concentration, yes. And while I'm taking a picture of this, these are lab data or these are sensor data based on conductivity? I'm sorry, yeah, these are lab data. Those are very healthy. And what was the duration of time during oh, which you were in exceedance of those? Uh, of like the 500 there? A long sorry, time. I'm just looking at how long were we in exceedance of those high chloride concentrations? Uh, I do, I probably have that information. Yeah. Um, so this would have been like a disco run from. Okay. You know, all that. And, and can you just swing micro, like a thousand micro EQs into milligrams per liter for me? Do you have that in your head or not? No. Okay. I think 1500 is about 50. 1,500 is 50? All right. I think I just did that in my hand. Thanks. Mm -hmm. It's much higher around here, though, yeah. Go ahead. Maybe you alluded to precip and your key findings. I was interested in what attempts have been made to measure precip differences between the basins, and particularly thinking about whether wind blow snow might yeah. accumulate a lot more in that slightly higher watershed. Yeah. There have been too many attempts <laughs> for me to um, to justify the results, I can, I can tell you. Uh, we, we have a lot of tries of this. We, we put out elevation, a gauges long elevation transect. Just so many times, so many things went wrong for us to, to get good data. And, and a lot of the times, it just doesn't seem to show much difference in elevation elevational The snow theory, um, Charlie Cockrell really shot that down. Didn't think that there could possibly be enough blowing into the basin to make that kind of difference. And I, it's just kind of a back of the envelope calculation. We've done snow snow surveys, do snow weather equivalent. There's definitely more in that basin, but again, it doesn't seem to match the <coughs> So I didn't put that slide up, but there is about a 30% higher nitrate flux from the Durella Basin. Uh, <laughs> I, I should look into whether that can be explained by the, the ski racing conditions, but I would suspect that it's from septic. Because there is so much development now on this first especially. Quick one, Neil. 
Yeah. I've, all, I've had this on my mind for a long time in terms of explaining the lag and peak once you get past the snow melt on the West Branch. Do you have any thoughts as to what the effect of the boulder field and like under boulder ice might be up in Smuggler's Notch above the snow that might maybe just, just provide keep this? Feeding it. Hmm? Just keep feeding it. Through the yeah, snow. that's that. Yeah, it's like there over time. It's always there all summer, and it gets added to a little bit. I don't know. Just is that true? That I'm just, just asking you whether you no, thought no, about. I mean, if that were true, it could definitely. It just seems like too small an area, but is, do we know that there really is ice persistent? I don't. I just have oh, okay. to figure it's huge blocks and it yeah. goes deep, you know, so there's other areas in Vermont where there are. Yeah, yes, yeah. So, so I, I guess I would say maybe that line of thinking might be on the right track, but it, just in general, there must, there could be just a larger aquifer, deeper soils, more storage in that basin to help kind of sustain that summer. Well, we can counteract the surface. Thank you.